What's up everybody? So in this video, we're going to be talking a little bit more about the classification of biodiversity. Specifically, we're going to focus on the animal phylum. Okay, I already did a video on the plant phylum, so now we're moving on to animal phylum. Now, we know that we have so many creatures on Earth. Just look at this cheetah and the springbok, okay? We have so many creatures. Now, we need to organize them in a logical manner. So basically, all organisms on Earth can be categorized into one of three domains. So there's three domains, okay? And we know that all the animals, I mean all the eukaryotic organisms such as plant and animals, all the uh, organisms with eukaryotic cells will go under this category. Now, everything under this category can, can be divided into kingdoms. So, for example, the eukarya, all the organisms here, can be divided into plants, animals, fungi, and protista. Now in this video, like I said, we're only going to focus on the animal part, okay, the animal part. So we can delete all of these, we're only going to look at the animals. Now, the animals can be divided even further into phylums, right, because we know we're getting from more general at the domain to the most specific at the species, okay? So now animals can be divided into some phylums. So let's see what they can be divided into. We can divide the animals into these phylums, seven phylums, okay? Look at all these crazy, crazy names. And this will give you hell, I know that. But it's just one of those things. The main thing about this topic of topic five, it's just names, man, so many names. You just gotta write them down on your bathroom mirror and just see them every day until they're in your head, okay? It's just one of those annoying things. So we can see here, we got Porifera, Nidaria, Annelida, Platai Helminths, Mollusca, Arthropoda, Chordata, all these crazy names. Now, in general, all of these can be classified as either vertebrae or invertebrae. So we know all animals can either be considered a vertebrate or an invertebrate. If it's a vertebrate, it means it has a spinal cord or um, a vertebral column, hence the name, a vertebral column or a spinal cord, right? Like us, we are vertebrates because we have this spinal, uh, spinal column or backbone in simple terms. If you're an invertebrate, it means you don't have this. You don't have this vertebral column, okay? You're invertebrate. Now, let's talk about each of these um, phylums individually and see what key details that you really need to grasp and really need to know. So let's start off with Porifera. Porifera, okay? So first of all, I want to start off by giving you some pictures of examples of organisms that are classified, animals, I mean, that are classified under this category. So first of all, an example would be sponges. What the hell is that? You can think of SpongeBob. You know SpongeBob, he lives under the sea, right? He lives in an aquatic environment, right? Under the ocean. And he, in fact, is a sponge, okay? We all think of him as a sponge, the one we use in our, in our kitchen, but actually, he is a sponge that is a name for an organism in the ocean, okay? Um, SpongeBob. And basically, this organism is classified under Porifera, okay? So, there, here are some real-life examples. That's the sponge one, the fake one, but we know it's SpongeBob. And then there's some other ones, okay? And here's a drawing version, okay? So... These are organisms classified under Porifera. An example is sponges. There might be other examples, but we only need to care about sponges, okay? Just think SpongeBob. Now, what else do we need to know? We need to know that these organisms have no clear symmetry. So if we look at this image here, okay, this is one sponge, okay? There is no way we can cut to make it 100% um, symmetrical, okay? It's always going to be kind of not clear, okay? There's no clear symmetry. Maybe it might seem like there's symmetry in one direction, but it's not always clear. It's not always obvious where to draw that line of symmetry, okay? So that's what we consider. We consider that they don't have a clear symmetry. Uh, by the way, for all of this, all the organisms I'm talking about, I have a nice table that's going to summarize all the key information that you need to know. So um, right now I'm just explaining the why they matter, what you need to know specifically. So also, these organisms have no body cavity. What do I mean by that? This means they have no mouth or butthole. They have none of that. No, no peeing hole, no butthole, no mouth, no nose hole, nothing like that. They have no cavities. Instead, we call it pores. So you can see here, there's some small tiny holes that, that allow water to go in and food to go in and all these things. Very many tiny holes. We call them pores. But they don't directly have a mouth or, a, or an anus. Okay, So we consider that they have no body cavity. In simple terms, all their food will just be absorbed from the ocean in 
through these pores and they'll be used for energy and then all the waste will exit through these pores, okay? Now next, they have no tissues. What do I mean by tissues? So a human, we are, we ha we are made up of muscle tissue, heart tissue, nervous tissue, um, cardiac tissue, like heart tissue, digestive tissue. They have none of this, okay? They don't have any of these systems or tissues. They're a very simple organism. Aquatic, okay, like I said, they're under the ocean. So these organisms are all aquatic. Now, they can oftentimes, have you noticed sometimes you expect these things to be so soft? So you go under the ocean and you're like, oh, it's going to be so spongy, so soft, hence the name. But actually, they can be rock hard sometimes. That's because some of them can create a sort of skeleton, not like a human skeleton. It's more like um, the skeleton just meaning that it's hard. They can create this sort of skeleton that's made up of calcium carbonate or silicone. And this material is super hard. So if you touch it, it will actually be really hard. And this is obviously for like protection from all the water streams and animals and things like that. Okay, so it's a sort of a protection mechanism. So this is all you need to know about porifera. Just know it's a real simple organism, um, an example of SpongeBob and all these small details. Okay, because we're going to compare it now to these other categories and you'll see where the differences lie. So let's go to the next one. Nidaria. Nidaria. Okay, so again, first let's look at an example. Nidaria include um, sea anemones, corals, and jellyfish. Okay, so again, these are some examples. There might be more, but these are some key ones that you need to know. So let me show you some pictures. So if we look at them, this right here is an anemone. Anemone. This is where Nemo hides. Remember, uh, uh, let me show you a better picture, a real life one. If you see Nemo, you know he hides in these things, these little hair-like things called anemones, okay? And this is also considered an animal, okay? Um, not a plant, it's an animal. It's, con it's categorized under Nidaria. And there are many other examples, such as this one. I don't know if you've seen this at the ocean. If you live in South Africa or places like Australia, you would see a lot of these, okay? These are pretty dangerous, and they're also considered an animal. They're pretty poisonous, pretty venomous. venomous. Um, then, yeah, this is basically the same picture that I that I created here. Um, these are some corals, so you can see a lot of corals and things like that, and some jellyfish, okay? So, these are just some key examples of stuff that uh, is going on, okay? So, these are examples. So, let's see what are some features that they have that are unique. So, first of all, they have radial symmetry. So, notice for this one, Porifera, we said they have no clear symmetry. No matter how you slice it, it won't be symmetrical, okay? No, maybe sometimes, but it's not clear. Whereas of this one, there's something called radial symmetry, which means, let's take this example here, this one. If you look from the top, you'll see a circle, right? A general circle shape. No matter how you cut it in the middle, it's always going to be symmetrical. If you cut here, it's symmetrical. Cut there, symmetrical. There, symmetrical. If you're looking from the top, right? So these organisms have radial symmetry, okay? No matter how you chop them, they are likely to have radial symmetry, okay? Especially this one right here. It may not be so true for even, even this one, even the um, jellyfish. If you look from the top and you slice it, it's always going to be symmetrical, okay? So same for the corals. Maybe not that clear. Maybe it's not that clear for these two. But just know in general, this is a feature of Nadaria, okay? They tend to have radial symmetry. There are obviously always going to be some exceptions to every rule. Okay, next one one opening. So remember, for porifera, we said they have no body cavities, no openings. They just have pores, okay? Um, small holes everywhere. These actually have an opening, but they only have one opening. So you know how humans have, like, we have a mouth where food goes in, and then an anus where food goes out. These organisms only have one, one hole, both for things to go in and both for things to go out. So that's pretty interesting. Imagine you pooped and ate from your mouth. That's basically what these organisms do. So they have one opening, which is which means... Both, uh, it serves both as their mouth and their anus, okay? Because if you look at this picture, here's the opening. Things go in and things come out of there. Next, they have tissues. So they have little, um, if you slice them open and look inside, they have kind of little, um, little um, organs, okay? Little tissues that are able to do jobs, unlike these, these uh, porifera, okay? So that's another key thing. Uh, they are also aquatic. Notice they are all underwater, right? So that's another key thing there. Um, what makes these also unique, besides their symmetry and their opening compared to porifera, is that they have little uh, cells called nematocysts. And these cells, or these uh, structures, um, sting. They cause stinging. And that makes sense, because most of these, like this one if you touch it, or anemones, or these, if you touch them, you get shocked. 
And this is basically a mechanism by which they kill organisms. And then they will use their tentacles, which we can see they all have, to grab the organism and move it towards their mouth. Okay, so that's an interesting thing you need to know. So that's it for Nadaria. Let's move on to the next one. It's going to get more and more complicated as we go down. Like the organisms get from very simple to more realistic, more human-like, okay, over time. So let's see an Annelida. So this one, uh, basically these are worms, okay? Earthworms, lugworms, leeches. Let me show you some pictures. So here is an earthworm, right? And here we have a, a leech. These suck on your skin and suck your blood out, basically. There's another earthworm, a real picture. There's another picture here, okay? So these are essentially worms. And specifically, these worms are bilaterally, bilateral, have bilateral symmetry. So we just said here that these nadaria are radial symmetr symmetrical, meaning you can cut them left, right, diagonally. They're always going to be symmetrical from the top. But these, they're only symmetrical in one way. Okay, so you need to slice, for example, from here, down the middle of the body, all the way through to the other side. That's bilateral symmetry, because the one half will look like the other half. But if you slice like this, like this way, then this half is different from this half, right? Because this half might be the, the butt, and this might be the head. Okay, so they're not symmetrical. So these organisms are bilateral symmetrical, meaning you got to cut them in the midway through. Kind of like having a human, if you cut it from the top, from the head down through the middle, through the body, that's also bilateral symmetry, okay? So that's what bilateral symmetry means. These organisms have bilateral symmetry. Uh, they have two openings. So remember, we have these that had one opening uh, that were represented both the mouth and the anus. Now these have two, one for the food, one for mouth, and one as the anus. So this could be the anus and this could be the mouth, okay? So that's already getting more, more human-like, like I said. And these also have tissues, just like the nadaria, okay? This means that they have little organs. If you cut them open, they'll have a stomach, an esophagus, uh, things like this. They have little tissues and organs, little heart, things like that, okay? Um, they, are, they could be half-half. So these could be aquatic, meaning they could live underwater, or they could live in the soil, like earthworms, okay? So they're not necessarily just for aquatic scenarios, like the nadaria and porifera that we just covered. Lastly, oh, sorry. Lastly, these are segmented. This is a very key thing about these. You look, they're, they're like little segments, right? Little discs that you can slice through here. Okay, that's a very key feature about these worms. This category is segmented worms, meaning they have little slices like this, little discs, okay? Okay, moving on to the next one, we have platy helminths. Okay, platy helminths. Basically, these um, are flat worms flat worms so we covered here like round worms right they're round um you can see they're round cylindrical like right and they have segments now this category includes uh it sounds like flat plat okay flat worms these are flat worms so if you look at them they're literally worms that are flat okay let me make this bigger okay so you can see they're literally flat okay now these are also bilateral symmetrical, meaning, again, if you cut them through the middle like this, or let's use this picture, if you cut them through the middle like this, from the head to the toe, then they will be symmetrical, both pieces will be um, symmetrical, right? They can fold onto each other. Now, the next one is, um, the next thing we need to know is that they also, unlike this one, remember, this one had two openings, a mouth and an anus. Now, this one here only has one opening, okay, one for the mouth and one for the anus. Okay, so both the food goes into here and the, the waste comes out of here. Okay, this doesn't, this is the eyes and all that, but their mouth is, they don't have a mouth. This is, everything goes out of one hole. Okay, so that's also unique. That's also a key difference between these uh, two worms, the platy helminths and the annelida. Okay, next, they also have tissues. Again, that means hearts, digestive system, all this. Okay, they can be free living, aquatic, um, so they can be in the ocean basically, or they can live inside um, organisms. So, for example, these can be parasites. They can inv invade our body and live inside us, okay? That's what a parasite means. So, these worms, for example, um, especially a tapeworm, maybe you've heard of this. This is an example of a flatworm. Oh, yeah, that's a key thing. They are all flat, flatworms. Now, a tapeworm is like a flatworm that you can find, and sometimes it infects you, and it's like very long, like five meters long. And it can be found in your body. And so when you find it, you can have serious stomach pain and all this. 
and the doctors have to pull it out. And it's quite disgusting because it's like a five meter long worm that you had inside of you this whole time. So that's pretty interesting. So they can also be parasites. Okay, so next, we're getting there, guys. It's pretty slow, this, but um, it's just a lot of annoying names and features that you need to remember. Okay, so Mollusca. Now we're moving on to this third last one, Mollusca. Now, what are these? So let's look at an example. These are small and large. They can be small and large organisms, such as slugs, snails, giant squid, and octopus, okay? So let's look at some pictures again. So we have a snail. Okay, we have this here, octopus or uh, squid, uh, and then we have another snail there, real picture. So these organisms are also bilateral symmetrical. So if we take the organism, we slice it through half, it, both sides will be equal again, okay? They also have two openings, an anus and a mouth. So they have a, they have a mouth and a butt somewhere, okay? Uh, they also have tissues, right? They have a brain, they have all this kind of things going on. Uh, they can live uh, either on, in the ocean or on land, so the terrestrial or aquatics. For example, a snail can live um, on land, and this one, octopus or squid, can live in the ocean. This is the second largest animal phylum. This means that this phylum has the second most organisms, okay? Um, of, like, is the, is the phylum with the second most organisms. The only one beating it is the arthropoda, okay? That one has the most, the most organisms. Okay, and sometimes, not always, these organisms could also have, remember we, we talked about it for porifera, the porifera could have a, a skeleton uh, that, that is created by calcium carbonate that makes it hard, right? Now, same with these. These organisms, for example, a snail, can make a shell, and the shell could be made up of calcium carbonate as well, and this is hard, helps protect it, right? So it can hide inside when another organism tries to eat it. Okay, that's it for mollusca, okay? Um, let's go move on to the next one, arthropods. So we're getting now to the um, kind of kind of creatures that no one likes. Okay, so these include scorpions, spiders, and things like that. Uh, crab and lobster. That is goes under the category of crustaceans. Crustaceans include crabs and lobsters. Um, okay, so these are all the organisms get a bit weird, like spiders. Okay, and crabs, the ones we don't love to to see at night. Okay, so. These are also bilateral, sim bilateral ha also have bilateral symmetry. We cut them in half, both sides will be the same. See, all of these features are quite repetitive. There's just slight differences between each of the phylums that you need to kind of stick with and know because multiple choice questions will test that, okay? Um, these, obviously, two openings. They have a mouth and a butt, okay? They also have tissues. They can be aquatic and terrestrial, like a crab, aquatic, Spider can be terrestrial. They are the largest, remember? They are the largest, meaning they have the most species, most organisms are of animals is under this one. Second most um, was the mollusca, as we just saw, right? Now these, interesting, this is a unique thing that you need to know about arthropoda. They have an exoskeleton. So a human um, has an, uh, or other organisms have endoskeletons, meaning our skeleton is the most inner part of our body. It's inside our body. Okay, it's, it's the it's holding our um, our um, it is the most center of our body. Whereas these organisms, their skeleton is exo. This means outside. So their skeleton is actually on the most outer side of their body. That's why they feel so hard sometimes. Because when you feel this one, it's very hard. Its skeleton is on the outside, and everything else is on the inside. Whereas for humans, um, our skeleton is is endoskeleton. So everything is outside of our skeleton. Our organs are outside of our skeleton, not inside our skeleton, okay? So that's what exoskeleton mean, it means, and it's made up of chitin, okay? So our, all the arthropods, like spiders and crabs, they have an exoskeleton. That's why their surface is so hard. Their skeleton is the most outer layer. Um, and again, they also have segmented bodies because they obviously have clear legs, clear heads. It, they're, they're are, they're, they have segments, okay? They're not like one big blob of organism, okay? They have clear segments, just like the, the one worm I showed you, remember the Annelidas? They had the clear segmented body. Now, one last thing is, the reason why these organisms don't get so big is because of their exoskeleton. Their exoskeleton needs to be, be, needs to be replaced every now and then. Like, imagine a human had to replace their, their, whole, their whole body, I mean, their whole uh, skeleton the whole time. We wouldn't be able to get big, right? We don't need to replace our skeleton, but these organisms, the exoskeleton needs to be replaced. That's why they, they grow, um, to a certain size, and then they need to replace it. So that stops them from getting very big, okay? Because they keep getting to a size, and then they destroy it and create a new one. 
So they never get big, and that's why. That's part of the reason why. Okay, finally, guys, we're getting to the last one. This is a, a lot of organisms. Now we're getting to humans, man. We're in this category, finally. Chordata, chordata, okay? So let me show you here. Chordata is a bit more complicated, okay? Chordata can be, in general, divided into three types of organisms. Vertebrates, tunicates, and cephalochordates, okay? These three categories. Vertebrates is us, okay? Mammals. We are mammals. And it includes also amphibians, fish, birds, reptiles, okay? These are all vertebrates. They all have what? A spinal cord, a vertebral column, right? Now, another category of the chordata is tunicates. These include sea squirts and salps. You can look up some images. These look pretty interesting. And, um, and then also the last one, cephalochordates. These are super small organisms, super small organisms, also known as lancelets. Again, look up some images if you want to know more about this. But um, what, what we need to know is what all these have in common. Why are all these considered chordata? We have these different categories, vertebrate, tunicates, and cephalochordates. But why are they all under this category of chordata? What are the similarities that they have that we need to know about? So they are various, and we'll talk about them. Uh, so yeah, again here, vertebrates include fish, reptiles, uh, birds, um, amphibians, and uh, mammals. Mammals, uh, where's my mammal? I had a mammal here somewhere. There's my mammal. The giraffe, okay, our mammal. And then these are called sea squirts, okay? You can see they have like little bones and stuff, okay? That's why they're also considered um, uh, part of chordates, and you'll see why. Okay, so now let's get into understanding. What makes a chordate a chordate? What do you need to have that makes a chordate a chordate? Okay, we're going to get to that just now, but first we want to look at some stuff. Okay, examples. We just talked about them. Again, uh, because... Vertebrates is such a big category. I'll make a separate video on this, but really for IB, you don't need to know much more than what I just said. Um, but I'll make a small video of some key details that might come up, but it's not a big thing for the IB. Okay, so these organisms are also bilaterally symmetrical. Think about us. Think about humans. You cut us in half, we'll be symmetrical. Uh, we have multiple openings, so not just necessarily a mouth and an anus. We could have a nose hole, a pee hole, all these kinds of things, right? So we have multiple. Now, we also have tissues, right? We can be aquatic or terrestrial, right? Because uh, reptiles, for example, or fish can be in the ocean and we can be on land. And then lastly, what now? Now we're going to get to what makes all of these under the same category. What do all of these categories need to have to be considered a chordate? Okay, here I have a small page. So, this is an annoying thing because really it's very complicated in reality. You're gonna, you, you would learn this more in like, um, university level kind of thing, but there's some small details that you need to know. So it may not be too clear at this level, but at least I can try and give an effort to help you a little bit on this. But you don't need to know detail about this at all. So that's why it might be annoying because you might have to remember or memorize a bit. They will never ask you to explain this though. Okay, so what all these organisms need to have in common is one, a dorsal nerve cord. Let me undo this. Let's do one by one. A dorsal nerve cord. This is basically the thing that is going to become the spinal cord. And we know that all of these need to have had, at some point in their life, a spinal cord, okay? Maybe when it's a baby, maybe when it's an adult, at some point. They don't need to have a spinal cord at any given moment, but at some point in their lifetime, they need to have all these features that I'm talking about, okay? So next, a notochord. This is also a little cord. So, for example, this is, this is basically a picture of what it looks like before it's developed, Okay, all of these organisms, all of these chordata originate from this kind of organism, okay, this kind of embryo, okay, so we can see here this one is the nerve cord, this becomes your spinal cord, and then this is the notochord, which will become, which is basically the thing that we don't have right now as adults, but um, as at least humans, but when you're an embryo, you have this notochord and it helps to um, make sure that you're going to be symmetrical when you grow up so that you don't have one massive arm and one small arm and so on. This thing helps for symmetry. And then next, post-anal tail. So humans, we don't have a tail, but we have a tailbone, right? We can feel it. Dogs, for example, have a full-on tail. So all of these organisms, all of these must have had at some point a post-anal tail, okay? And it's uh, obviously for fish, it's used for swimming. For a thing like a dog, it's used for balance. And then last one here is pharyngeal slits, okay? These are little slits like this, 
and this is um, the place where your mouth and um, stuff will um, will form from okay so this is obviously an embryo meaning it's not developed yet but all of these things will so this one will turn into your spinal cord this won't turn into anything it's only present in the embryo this one will turn into your tailbone or a tail this one will turn into your mouth or your um, lungs like your 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 breathing mechanism okay so you need to know that these four things is what all organisms all these organisms had at one point in their life okay at one point at their life in their life at least and they all kind of form from from this structure at some point okay so we all have come from this essentially so here is um, a nice summary table that includes all the key things that you may need to know um, hopefully hopefully the names won't be too hard for you but it's gonna take some repetition and like I said I'll make sure to make a more clear video on um, vertebrae I just think it needs a full-on video by itself it's a bit it's too rushed if I rush it in now um, but like I said don't worry about this one you don't need to know much at all for the IB about this just know that it's under the category of chordata okay so that's it for animal phylums